This is part two of our series in demand, or about the demand curve. And this one we're going to deal with changes in demand and changes in quantity demanded. And it's a really important distinction. It's not just about semantics. Let's say I want to do a study of how much time spent studying affects a student's overall GPA. And what I do is I can find out truthfully how much each student spent studying and measure their GPA and verify both of those and then plot this on the graph. So each one of these dots represents an individual student and their GPA as well as the time spent studying in terms of hours per week. And as we can see it's pretty scattered everywhere. But we can take a student here, let's say this student spends roughly five and a half hours studying and has just barely a 0 0.6, 0 0.7 overall GPA. This student up here spends less, you know, four hours studying and has a 4.0 GPA. Similarly, this student over here spends about 20 hours a week studying and also has a 4.0 GPA. So it seems like there's really no correlation between time spent studying in terms of how much, how many hours per week a student spends studying and their overall GPA. We can draw a line as somewhat of an average, but again, it has no effect whatsoever and the data points are dispersed too broadly to get anything meaningful from this. Now, maybe what I'm doing is we need to look at other factors besides time spent studying that will affect your GPA. So one thing we can do is we look at something, say, IQ. If we took students and broke them down by IQ and then measured within each group how many hours you spent studying and compared the GPA, we might get a little more meaningful results from that. So we take everybody whose uh, IQ is between 80 and 90 and look at their time spent studying and their GPA, and 90 and 100, look at their time spent studying and GPA, and 100 to 110, etc. And so we want to control for IQ. We can also control for the difficulty of classes. Some students take very easy courses, some students take more difficult courses. If we could have a metric that we could, or some quantitative scale, that we could measure the difficulty of classes, we could then control for difficulty of classes. We also might want to look at SAT score. SAT score is not a measure of intelligence, but it is a measure of how prepared you are for a first year in college. And if we control for SAT score, again, we can get a little more meaningful results. And maybe we want to look at, say, roommates. Uh, you know, if you have a roommate who's a partier, you're likely to be influenced by that. You're going to party more. If your roommate is studious, you're going to be influenced by that. You're going to spend more time studying, and you're going to have a, you know, a more success studying than if your roommate's sitting on TV, playing video games, and partying the whole time. And once we're able to control for these other factors, then we get something that looks more closely like this. It looks something more like this. And now we see that the lines are grouped more, and there is definitely a trend moving upward. And this now becomes our data points and, and our uh, equation to tell us how effective time spent studying is on a student's GPA. And so what we can do is we can say the GPA is some function of the time you spend studying and these other things, IQ, the difficulty of classes, your SAT score, and your roommate. So the time spent studying is just one factor that affects your GPA. We're controlling these other. Now keep in mind, in this model, what we want to look at is simply the effect of time on GPA holding these other factors constant. We hold the IQ at, say, 100, the difficulty at a level of 5, the SAT at, say, 1,200 for math and verbal, and some dummy variable of 1 or 0 for a roommate uh, who is a partier. And we get some ideas when we control for these other factors. Now we can get a better idea of the effect time has on, or time spent studying has on your GPA. What might the Flynn effect have on this? Now, the Flynn effect says, as time goes on, the world becomes more complex, we become more technologically oriented, and therefore, average IQs begin to rise. If this is the case, then what we would say is the IQ changes. So the GPA is some function of time. Changes in time will be movement along that purple line. More time spent studying is ha will have a positive effect on the GPA. But any of those other factors will actually shift that line. So if IQ changes due to the Flynn effect, then it's going to shift upward like this. And for any given amount of time spent studying, average GPA should rise. And that's why the shift upward. Now, I haven't moved all the dots upward, but they would shift upward as well. 
I'm just showing that the line shifts because that is a change in the uh, the overall GPA scale given that the IQ changed. We do the same thing with a demand curve. So we'll start off with again our price and quantity and we have our uh, schedule here and we have our demand curve equation which is quantity demand is equal to 10 minus P and now we have the same variables we had before we have our demand curve. At a price of eight dollars two units will be consumed and again at a price of three dollars seven units will be consumed. This is movement along the demand curve. What this model is trying to tell us is how many units people are willing to buy whatever good this is at different prices. So at $8 they're willing to buy two, at $3 they're willing to buy seven units. If other factors change that will be a movement of the demand curve. So what we want to say with this right here is a change from $8 to $3 increased the quantity demanded of this good. It went from two units to seven units. That's an increase in the quantity demanded. If other factors change that would cause the demand curve to actually shift. So what are some of those other factors? Again, we looked at the time spent studying on GPA and we looked at things like IQ, uh, the difficulty of the classes, the SAT score, and whether your friend is a partier or not, your roommate's a partier. Well, we do the same thing with a demand curve. What other things besides the price of some good determines how many units of that good you buy, whether you buy any units at all? And one thing we want to look at is your taste. This could be something, maybe you have a change in taste for something, or you don't have the taste for something. A lot of students don't like liver and onions, so they have no the demand curve for liver and onions. You couldn't even get them to buy it if it were free, or even they, you know, I'd have to pay you for it. But if we look at ice cream, you're willing to buy more, and depending on, say, health reasons. Let's say as you get older, you find out that ice cream isn't as good for you, your demand for ice cream decreases. Uh, so taste will change, which will shift the demand curve. The number of consumers. The more consumers who move into a market, the demand curve will shift up. This explains why rent in Manhattan is so much higher than the rent in, say, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the number of consumers will increase. An increase in the number of consumers will increase the demand for some good or service. Number three is income. As our incomes go up, we buy more of a normal good, and that will shift the demand curve for that good up. So we're talking about cars, the demand curve for cars. As incomes increase, the demand curve for cars shifts up. It doesn't mean necessarily we buy more cars, although it certainly could, but we spend more money on cars. We buy nicer cars. We buy cars with more amenities to them. Uh, this would be an increase in the demand for automobiles. Now, if it's an inferior good, as our incomes go up, the demand would decrease. Something like spam, or although unless you're in Hawaii, spam is considered a delicacy or something good. Uh, for the rest of the United States, spam might be an inferior good. Ramen noodles. After you graduate from college, your consumption of ramen noodles will probably go to zero. So that would be an inferior good. Number four would be the price of other goods, complements and substitutes. If you always drink cream with your coffee and the price of cream increases, your consumption of cream is going to decrease, therefore your consumption of quantity, your consumption of coffee is going to decrease, which means the demand for coffee will decrease. So let, let's take a look at the market for cream. As the price increased for whatever reason, your quantity demanded of cream decreased, which caused a decrease in the demand for coffee. So when we look at something like a complement, they will go in opposite directions. When the price of the complement goes up, the demand for the other good or the primary good goes down. When the, de when the price of uh, cream goes up, the demand for coffee fell. When we're dealing with substitutes, they move in the same direction. I'm indifferent between drinking coffee and tea. If the price of coffee goes up, my demand for tea increases because I shift away from coffee and now drink more tea. So the price of other goods will shift the demand curve. And the last thing is the expectations of future price changes. If I believe that, say, the price of gasoline is going to increase 25% next week, I'm going to immediately go out and buy gas today, so will everybody else, and that increases the demand for gasoline. So expectations of future price changes will shift the demand curve. So we can take a look at this. Let's start with five units at $5. What happened to the demand for cream when the price of coffee increases?
Well, again, we look at the price of co um, the demand for. We, this is the opposite of what I used. I use what happens to the demand for coffee when the price of cream incre uh, increases. Let's do it the other way. This is the demand for cream when the price of coffee increases. These are complementary goods, therefore the demand is going to decrease, and that means at any given price, consumers will purchase less cream. So there is a decrease in the demand for cream as the price of coffee increases. We can look at another example starting out at five dollars and five units. What happens to demand for peanut butter when the American Medical Association publishes a report extolling the benefits of eating peanut butter? It's good for you, it's good for your heart, whatever it is, therefore people's taste for peanut butter is going to change. And their demand for peanut butter is going to increase. So therefore, at any given price, they're going to want to consume more peanut butter. The change in taste caused an increase in the demand for peanut butter. Now one last one we'll look at, what happens in the market for cell phones as the price of cell phones decreases. Now again, this is the important distinction between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded. The model we have here, this is the market for cell phones, and what we want to find out is what happens in this market as the price of cell phones decreases. That would be movement along this demand curve. So therefore, there would be no change in demand. It would be an increase in quantity demanded caused by the lower price of cell phones. Now, why this is important? Um, there was an example of a politician who once said that if you increase the tax on cigarettes, that's going to cause the, the price of cigarettes to increase, which will decrease the demand for cigarettes, therefore causing the price of cigarettes to fall and more people will smoke. Now again, that's a convoluted explanation. However, anyone ever came up with that, it's hard to believe. But when you think about it, when the, increase the, uh, when the taxes on cigarettes are increased, that would be a decrease in quantity demanded as a result of that higher price, not a decrease in demand. Those are two different things. So in the example here, when the market for cell phones, when we have a market for cell phones and the price of cell phones decreases, the quantity demanded increases. That's movement along the demand curve not a change in demand. This concludes part two of our series on demand.